On this week's show, we discuss when property investors and entrepreneurs can finally get back to doing service accommodation. And we're going to be asking or asking, we're going to be answering all of your property related questions. Welcome to the Property Investors Podcast. Thanks so much for tuning in. Make sure you subscribe so you never miss an upload. You can catch us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube. Enjoy this week's show and don't forget to share it with all your friends. Hi, I'm Russell Leeds. Hey, I'm Alistair Cunningham. And welcome to the Property Investors Podcast. Uh, how are you doing, my friend? Are you well? I'm good. I'm good. It's good to have you back. We've missed uh, we, we missed a couple of weeks for various I've, reasons. I've, I've um, been away. I've, I've, I've broke my arm, as you can probably... <laughs> you dropped it. You dropped it. I was going to play it up. So I'll right. see you've got some, uh, some sling wrap around your neck. How did that happen? Oh, I, didn't, I didn't want people that are watching on YouTube just to think that I've gone for a pink scarf, you know. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I'm a pink scarf, a t-shirt. Come, yeah. on, come on, come on, drop us. How, how did you break your arm? Or your, you break your elbow? I broke my elbow. So it's a, it's a, basically what I was doing was I. It's just interesting because when when I got into the hospital, hold on, look, I, look, listen, guys, look, I'm trying to butter it up so it doesn't actually sound that bad when he tells you how it happened. Go on. No, no. So I got, I got to the hospital and they said, you know, what, what happened? And I said, I, um, I fell off a scooter. And she said, uh, oh, like an electric scooter. I was like, no, 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 child's scooter. She said, oh, what were you doing? What? What, what were you doing? Oh, I was racing my four-year-old nephew. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. You were doing little, uh, you were doing stunts and racing. Little, racing little. A did, he, did, he, did he win the race? Uh, he won that race. <laughs> Did you have any knee pads on or a helmet on? Uh, no, I was wearing shorts. I was on tarmac, so I was scraped. Basically, I went round uh, a corner. I was I was going pretty quick, pretty quick because it was down, it was down, it was down a hill. It was probably a similar speed to when you when you ride a bike. I don't know, yeah. 12, 30 miles an hour, something like that. Yeah. And uh, as I turned the corner, I was flying over the hand over the handlebars. <laughs> and my. Um, are they called handlebars on a scooter? I don't even oh, know. But because obviously it's quite small, so you, I was crouched over. Yeah. Um, yeah. Scratch when, on my when, leg, you, leg. when you told me the other day, um, and you he was said, just laughing you... at me. He was, he was just laughing, and I, was, I, I said, you know... I, I didn't even tell, didn't even tell him why. He was like, "Oh, how you doing?" Man? I was like, "Yeah, yeah, I'm all right." Is that anything interesting? I was like, "I did break my elbow." He's like, "Ha ha ha ha." I was like, it's not that. How's that funny? <laughs> you know what it was? I'll tell you exactly what it was, right? Uh, I, I rung you up when we were chatting, and I said, oh, I did. And you said, oh, I broke my elbow. And I'm like, oh, all right. And then you told me how you'd done it, and that was all right. I thought that was quite comical. But what really got me, and I had to mute my phone, right, was I said, you, you, you were telling me about how you can't do anything. And then you said, Anna has to tie your shoelaces. <laughs> yeah, I don't know why, but that just got me. And I was, I, I literally had to mute my phone. So I didn't, because you were like, <laughs> mate, I'm not laughing about this at the minute. Like, and I'm like, oh, all right. <laughs> well, I, well, I fell off. It so funny. I, didn't, I, didn't know, I didn't know I'd broken anything. Do you know, I, like, I, I could feel quite a lot of pain in my arm. But because I had pain in my leg, pain in my shoulder, pain in my arm, yeah. I was just like, oh, that, 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 does, that does hurt. I could feel it kind of all up. I was like, yeah, it's not too bad. I mean, I, I thought, I, I actually thought I haven't broken anything. I can move my hands still. I'm okay. Uh, I just thought, oh, well, you know, what a, what a pain. Anyway, I went back, was watching the football. I was watching the Man United game. This is on Saturday. And then I realized my arm had like locked. I couldn't move it. I couldn't stretch it out. I couldn't stretch it out. It was literally just locked where it was. Because I found out later, the joint had bled so much. The, the whole joint had swollen and then you couldn't move it because it was full of blood. Um, and I, I just thought, oh man, I literally can't move my arm at all. I thought this is a bit worrying. Um, so I went, I went down to A&E, had an x-ray, they were like, yeah, you've you, you, you broke it. You've you broke right. it, so. Is there, so. Did they have to drain the blood and all that sort of stuff? Do you know, they haven't really done anything. They gave me this sling, but I've I take it out of the sling because I, I want to, I want to, they said that if you don't sort of exercise it, yeah. you might lose movement. So I've tried to, I, I'm now tying my own shoelace, which we need to know. Ah, good, good, good. So I, can, I can sort of like lean over, I can because my hand, I've got use of my hands. Yeah. I can't put any pressure on, so I've got to tie them really loose. 
because I can't pull it tight because it hurts too much. Get some, yeah, yeah, yeah. Get some velcros. velcros. Get some velcros. That's what you need. Some velcros. Yeah, yeah. Some slip-ons. I should, I should get some slip-ons. But I, I'm, I'm fine. I'm still working out. I'm still yeah. doing everything. So I'm, I'm, I'm just having to be careful. So yeah. Lots, lots of squats and things like that that are just leg. It's, it's every day is leg day. Cool, cool. Um, Ona, you did mention the football there. Uh, I believe um, Liverpool have won the Premier League. Is that correct? That is, that is true. Well, I'm not a football fan, but did they not? How did how did they decide who won who won the the, the league? How did they, how did the, the FA or whoever controls it decide that? Are you serious? Well, because they were, didn't they? Wasn't there still games to play and all that sort of stuff? And wasn't there like games? They're back, in the they're back playing. Oh, were they? So yeah. that's, that's, that shows how they, they, they decide by who wins the most. Get who gets the most points. Well, I get that, but I thought they'd stop playing because um, I remember. No, hearing, I remember hearing in the news that they would have been. They were considering by giving up by default because they were. I can't remember why they were. Yeah, because they're so far ahead. Right. So basically, they've come back. They've won a few. They've won a couple of games, and they're so far ahead that no one else yeah. can mathematically catch them anymore. That's why they've won it. Right. Okay. Because I thought uh, when we were in the middle of lockdown, I remember hearing football fans kicking off saying it would be a disgrace if they just got given the, the when given the chance. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's funny because they they've won it the earliest ever. There's seven games still to play. Right. So they've won it the earliest ever, but date wise, they've won it the latest ever. Right. Okay. Does that make because because we're not normally playing. They're not. They're normally it'll be the Euros by now. It's like oh, June. Right. Yeah. It. It's so date wise, it's the oh. latest we've ever won a title. But but game wise, it's the earliest. So it's quite interesting. Right. Okay. Cool. I mean, but I, everything's opening up again, which is what we were talking about on this show. Because we want to talk about service accommodation. So, uh, I mean, we're, we're filming this a couple of days before it goes out. So I, I, I know there's there's sort of talk of of different areas. Do you hear about Leicester? Leicester, yeah. they're, they're put yeah. back into lockdown, but just yeah. Leicester. Just Leicester. Um, got back into lockdown with shops, and basically shops can't open again for another two weeks. Um, yeah, I mean, it's so interesting. Obviously, who knows whether, whether they're going to... thing because, like, look, I'm not saying um, there's not issues out there with COVID-19. Of course, there's something going on. But, like, two weeks ago... We had all these people protesting and rioting all around London and groups gathering to hundreds of thousands of people. We're not going back into lockdown, or like, do you know what I mean? So, how actually infectious is this infection? I, mean, I, I know it's infectious. I know there's issues, but what I'm getting at is like all these people gathering for various protests, but the 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 the, the increase in coronavirus has not followed suit like we were led to believe it would so um it's surprising to hear that leicester's gone back into lockdown considering that they weren't the leicester wasn't the forefront of the media with regards to like massive gatherings was it like it, it just wasn't no you'd expect you'd expect it to be london yeah. or bournemouth or Bo yeah you'd expect it to be somewhere where there was loads of gatherings um yeah. but it's funny i mean obviously yeah bournemouth was absolutely rammed um i i I had a friend that was down there and they, they FaceTimed me when they were down there. And it was like, it was absolutely heaving down there. Um, and yeah, I mean, it, it's, I don't know whether you agree with it or not, it's a different thing, but um, the fact that it was so heaving is it's not unexpected. Hottest day of the year, people have been locked down. Of course, they want to get out and have a bit of fun just and relax. Is it a bit irresponsible? Perhaps, who knows? Time will tell, time will tell. But obviously we're now July 4th. Like that's like, interesting. Yeah, well, that's what they're saying. Um, Wait, which is on. tomorrow. Hold on. July 4th, Independence Day. America's Independence Day. Could it be seen as Britain, the United Kingdom's Independence Day? Maybe we what, need a you're film. Allowed to, you're allowed to, but a film about it. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we need the day film. we were allowed to stay in service accommodation and go to pubs again. Oh, the day we're allowed to go out and go to pubs again. Uh, the day we're allowed to go out and, and go to... Uh, uh, restaurants are open, and I know they've got to have uh, social distancing and all that sort of stuff, so um, no, it's good. It's good that the world's... But here's a question for you, then. Obviously, we've got the pubs, but from a property investor's point of view, the big thing that's opening up again is, is uh, hotels, service accommodation, you can yeah. start staying. Do, do you expect it to be 
fully booked, heaving? Um, do, you, do you expect a lot of bookings in? Or do you think people are going to be cautious? I mean, judging by places like Bournemouth Beach. No. Could... Listen, I, I think, obviously, you're going to have your, your, portion of the, your, your portion of the country that are going to be cautious. But I think the majority of people are going to be like, get me out of here. I'm going somewhere. I want to go and book. So I want to go and stay somewhere. I want to go and get out of the apartment, get out of the house, whatever. And you'll find that there are, I think, Airbnbs and good locations, like especially touristy destinations, are going to be. I think they're going to be rammed. I really do. I think I've already spoke to several of the uh, the, the students that we work with, um, and they're already seen a, a massive increase in bookings. Uh, they're already seen. Uh, they're, they're putting things in motion with regards to cleaning teams and being being able to, to do it in an effective way. Um, so yeah, I, I absolutely think it's going to start picking up because um, really, like. I stayed in a service accommodation about three weeks ago when I went to do some viewings, but the shops and that were still pretty much closed. There was not re no, no real shops or restaurants open or anything like that. Um, and it was actually pretty, it was a really nice service accommodation. Actually, it actually belongs to um, Anthony Wilmot. So really nice service accommodation in Sheffield, but there was nothing to support that service accommodation. Do you know what I mean? So there was no restaurants open. There was no bars open. There was no... Pubs Which open. makes it, it's like pointless, isn't it? Pointless. If you go away, everything's closed. It's yeah. like, what's the point? Um, we, we, went into, we went into London a couple of weeks ago and it was, it was just like, what's the point? Well, why? What's the point in being here? I mean, London's a tiny bit different because obviously you can sightsee, you can go and have a look around. Yeah. But it's like, if you wouldn't, want, you wouldn't travel. You wouldn't, I mean, luckily we're really close, so it's, it's not too bad, but you definitely wouldn't travel because everything's closed. But it's obviously we, we've, with pubs and restaurants and things reopening. Yeah. Um, it's strange. Do you find it strange some of the things that they've allowed and some of the things that they haven't? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, so what, cinemas are allowed to open, but theatres aren't. And pubs are allowed to open. Yeah. I, saw, I saw an interesting that's, article about that's it. That's an interesting thought, actually. So cinemas are allowed to open because it's obviously from a screen, okay? There's not, it's not a live performance. I read that the reason they're not opening theatres is because there's live performers on stage. So anything that involves live performers are not allowed. I can't understand why, but I just think that's... It doesn't make sense, does it? Like, why are some things allowed to open but not other things? Why are... Um, like, I can't think of an example at the minute because you put me on the spot with that one, but... Um, I mean, I saw, saw an article about... Um, like comparing theatres to pubs, and they it was it was a sarcastic article. And they were sort of saying, "Oh well, it's, theatres have only got themselves to blame because you know pubs, everyone just sits there nicely watching the bartender, whereas at theatres, it was a sarcastic article. Oh. So whereas whereas at theatres, you're wandering around, pushing past people, drinking alcohol, yeah, getting right. drunk, yeah. sicking up on people, whereas at Whereas uh, uh, pubs, everyone's well behaved, and so it's obvious, obvious that pubs should be open and theatres should be closed. It's like, yeah, it's it's good, good point. So, I, you know, I tell you now, the pubs are opening Saturday. Um, I I I pretty much guarantee that Saturday night is going to be pretty interesting wherever there's a pub open. Right? Mm. There's going to be fights. There's going to be people arguing there's going to be people they're going to, honestly it's just not going to be because the minute you put a bit of drink in people suddenly and you you've so you combine it with all these factors they've been in lockdown for months they've been allowed to come out the house but now they're allowed to go out the house and drink and combine that with the weather if the weather is warm it's just to me it's a it's a it's a recipe for disaster it really is um and the, it, it was always going to happen it was, there was always going to be a point where the pubs opened um, and there'll always be that influx of people. And likewise, in every situation in life, you'll have some people that just ruin it for others and some people that deal with it respectfully. And it's mm. always the people that, that ruin it for others that ruin it. They, 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 they ruin it and they don't get the, the, the suitable punishment. Like, Yeah. So here's a, here's a question then. <laughs> here's the question. Do you think if you're uh, looking at getting into service accommodation, do you think now is a good time to get started? Uh, yes and no. Um, now is a good time to find deals, um, deals that are perhaps already up and running service accommodations, but the current runners or operators of them can't 
or haven't survived the coronavirus lockdown because they didn't run it as a proper business, they didn't have the funding in place to sort of support the, the, down, the downturn. So now is the opportunity to find potentially good up and running service accommodations that you can come in and a bit like a struggling business, you can come along, take the business and then go with it and make, make hay when the sun shines. Um, if you were to take on a brand new property at the minute, I think, I think it would be good, but I, I would absolutely make sure you factor in say, like at least three months worth of running costs before you even contemplate it. Um, I think now and, is a and brilliant sure, time. And, a and brilliant negotiate, time. negotiate, make sure you negotiate a, like a, a no deposit or a, 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 a rent-free period. But yeah, I, I agree with you. I do think it's a very, very good time. But I think there's two sides to it. I think let, me tell you, let, me tell you, let me tell you why I think it's a brilliant time right now. Number one is, I think from a socially distanced, nervous point of view, yep. I think a service accommodation unit is far better than a hotel mm -hmm. because you're self-contained. So you're going somewhere where you're completely self-contained. So I think it's going to be even more appealing to people that, that want to travel and stuff, but they're a little bit... It's about being in your own car. So yeah. like how can you pass it on when you when you're in your, when you when you're you're basically self isolating almost? Obviously you're going to go out and stuff. A Whereas in a hotel you're mixing a mingling of other people. So that's yeah, the point a lot of a lot of service accommodations are systemized in the sense that you don't actually have to see anybody. So it's all keypads. It's all yeah. Let yourself in exactly. barrier um, entry. Let yourself exactly. in type system. Exactly. Second, I think that people are, are going to want to start going out again now. So yeah. I, I, th I agree with you. I think there's going to be a a, a big influx. Third um, is, what was my third? I've got loads of points, but what's my third point? I'm just thinking out loud here. So third, go on. I'll tell you the third one. Because, on. like, I, I don't know if anyone, if, you, if you're going out much, the streets are busier. People are traveling more. There's so much traffic about out and about. Like, I've been out most days this last couple of, uh, this last week, and the streets are busy. Like, there's lots of business going on. Like, traveling salesmen are now working again. Um, builders are going to jobs again, so they're, lo they're looking to stay where they're working. There's so much more business going on than there was even like two weeks ago and even a month ago. So yeah. you've got all these contractors that are going to be looking to stay somewhere. For instance, I've got a property I've just completed in Bedford. My contractors are coming down from up north to do the job. They're looking for service accommodation in Bedford to stay while they're doing the work. So there's 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 lots of businesses open up and doing and doing stuff so as a result people and bear in mind the main uses the main users of service accommodation are business users so yeah. as that as business develops more people will stay so i do think it's a good time i just think there's i think there's two opportunities here i think the first opportunity is to take up and running service accommodations where the current operator couldn't run it uh, yeah. and the second one is new ones but make sure you got you you get um like rent free periods just to get you over the first month or two Fourth, then, mm -hmm. my third, but the now fourth, is um, there have been so many people that have been doing service combination units that quit during the time. So we've got like, yeah, let's talk about supply and demand. Mm -hmm. The demand, well, we think, is, is going to go back to what it was, but the yeah. supply has massively dropped. Yes, so yes. now is the time to get back and start. There's a lack of supply right now because so many people have stopped doing it. Yeah. Uh, and we know service accommodation is a massively growing industry anyway, so it's great. It's had a dip, but now is a great time to get back on. on, on. And fifth, if you're going to looking at rent, rent to service accommodation, or we'll know, we know this, it, landlords right now, it's been difficult to rent out properties because of the self-isolation, lack of viewings. So any landlord that was, has been trying to rent for the last little while are probably open to anything that's going to get it sorted so from a negotiation point of view if you're doing rent to rent service accommodation now is a brilliant time to yeah. jump on that because you've got landlords you're a landlord if you have had a property empty for three months are you suddenly a lot more interested in anything that comes your way suddenly the power is in is in the um out of the landlord's hands and into yeah. the person that's renting it off them's hands um, so for that reason that's one more. There's, there's definitely one more um right because obviously we were all expecting house prices and vendors to be negotiating like hell when it comes to selling properties. So it's just not happening. Um, I am not seeing house prices drop at all. and I'm not seeing any negotiations being accepted by estate agents or vendors. So now might not be the best time to buy. Now might be the time, if you've got 20, 30,000 pounds, now might be the time to put that into a rent to rent service accommodation as opposed to like a, a property you're going to buy like as an up and running HMO.
So while the buying market's a little bit stagnant with regards to um, any discounts or anything like that, it's definitely not in the rent to rent or the rental market because as you just said, the rent, uh, the, the vendors are happy to rent and get fixed guarantees or fixed, fixed prices for long-term rent because they've not been able to rent for three months. So I think that with any strategy, you just have to be flexible. So you don't always have to buy. Sometimes you go into the rental strategy because that might work for you. And you don't own, but you control. So, yeah, yeah, no, makes make, make, makes sense, makes sense. Now um, we've got we're we're, we're actually running a, a free webinar on service accommodation this um, in a couple of days on Monday. So we'll pop a link in if you're interested. Jump on that, find out a bit more about it's free. Find out a bit more about service accommodation and and, and, the, yeah. and the step by step guide of how to get into that. But I definitely think now is a uh, personally. I mean, that's why we're running the webinar because I think now is a good time mm. uh, to get into to get into service accommodation. Um, interesting, interesting. Uh, before we move on, so I was speaking to one of our academy students um, about three weeks ago, and um, I was helping him run some numbers on some deals he got. He used the, the we have an email set up for if you want any deal reviews, and he he contacted me about that. I went, I then spoke to him, and I said, "Look, I'll help you analyze it." Now, he was going to buy refurbish into a large HMO, maybe a six, seven bedroom HMO. Now, when we factored in all the costs, it was quite high to do the refurb. But then if you do it into, if you do it as a, instead of a HMO, do it into like six separate apartments or studio rooms for service accommodation for contractors, the costs go down drastically for conversion, but the income... What? It just does because you don't have to have the same. It's not the same regulation. It just uh, so there's certain things you don't need, and certain, but you still need fire doors, fire safety, and all that sort of stuff. But there's other things you just don't need. You don't need HMO license. So what happened was the costs have gone down, but his rental income is going to go up. So he's now going to run that as I think it was going to be a five, not not seven, but a five bedroom, all with little kitchenettes, all with en suites, and run it as a serviced accommodation building. Um, and well, there's no minimum room sizes, are, are there? Yeah, and, and all, all the rooms will have an electronic keypad on the door, electronic keypad to get them into the building, and it's just a big house. And I stayed in one in Wolverhampton when I used to come to the office all the time up there. And it was like, it was a, basically, it was a five bedroom HMO that they'd made into service accommodation apartments. And they were charging, from memory, I think it was £45 a night um, for this, this room. And it was completely systemized. And do you know what? Five rooms. I, I used to stay there a lot, and you couldn't always get booked in because it was it, it was high occupancy rate. So that just goes to show you that you can move around, and that service accommodation now might be the time to do it. Like definitely now might be the time to do it if you're buying instead of doing HMO going to set service accommodation model. Um, yeah, yeah, and obviously you got the option if you could turn it to HMO if you, if you wanted to. If, it, if the market changed, or you got you got you got the. Um, it's a very there. flexible strategy. I think it's very flexible when it comes to uh, exits and moving with the times and things like that. Because certainly, like, over the last three months, four months, like, HMO tenants have not been moving. Like, the, the demand for HMOs has dried up entirely. Um, and then the other problem you've got with HMOs, I mean, this is not about HMOs, but the other problem you've got with HMOs, like, one of my properties, one of my tenants has got COVID-19. So now the whole house has to isolate. Um, and it's just, yeah, so all sorts of problems. So, yeah. I think service accommodation is a great way to do it. Cool. Right, it's now time for this. Okay, so now it is time for the questions that you guys send in. Uh, we do our best to answer these every single week. Um, if you don't get your question answered, it's probably because it was a rubbish question. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> right, listen, if you want to put your questions in, send them to me on Instagram. Uh, any of my YouTube comments, um, LinkedIn, anywhere like that. Also, we generally do a uh, Facebook Live on Property Investors with Samuel Leeds and we take questions from there. So today I have a couple of questions and the first one come to me via Instagram from a, uh, a chap called Connor5 underscore. Um, and the question is, hi, I have a question if you can answer on the podcast, please. If you have properties not close to your house, how do you go about finding a property manager or who would manage a property for you? So <clears throat> to answer that question, look, my houses are not near where I live. You've, when, you, when you're looking at areas, um, 
when you're looking at an area for, for your properties, you need to consider a couple of things. And I've, I've actually just done a YouTube video about this, which will be on my YouTube channel in the next couple of weeks. So keep a lookout for that. But number one, you need to consider what strategy you're looking at. Now, um, you need to consider how much money you've got to invest because certain areas work better for certain strategies. And like, so for instance, SA works very well in one area, but HMOs might not work very well there. And likewise, HMOs might work well somewhere, but SA don't. So understand what strategy you want to go down. Next thing, understand if you want to manage it or somebody else wants to manage it. And then that, that determines where you buy that, where you buy your property. Now, if you're looking for a manager in a far away place, the easiest way to do it is to get into that area, go to the area, spend a couple of days up there, go and meet some letting agents, um, go and ch chat with them, find out how many properties they manage, how many rooms they manage, what's the delinquency rate, how many rooms are currently empty, how many uh, rooms are um, filled, what is the average rental income that they make, what do they charge, get a lot of information from them. So that's one source of finding somebody to manage it for you. The second source is to go to networking events in that area. And when you get an opportunity to stand up, stand up and ask people, um, look, ask them what, what, um, who manages your properties or is anybody looking to manage properties in this area? Um, and, and thirdly, is on the likes of spare room and all that sort of stuff, when you're looking through competition, um, you'll see a lot of landlords do self-managing. They manage their own properties and have a conversation with them and see if they would like to take on another property in that area. And it's, listen, property's about people. You just need to meet people and then the business will come. So you're not going to be able to do this from just sitting on right move and saying, oh, I'm going to use that person to manage my property because that doesn't work like that. Um, you want somebody that you can get along with, somebody that's reputable, somebody that um, will, will look after your house like you would uh, for your tenants. Um, so yeah, I hope that helps. Uh, next. <clears throat> um, right, okay. I have um, bum, 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 another question here, and this is from, where is that going? Hold on one second. Aha, here it is. It's from David James. Uh, question for the Property Investors Podcast. Hi, Alistair. Hope you're well. I am, thank you. Uh, we met at the DFE course back in 2018, and I've been tuning into the podcast you and Russell host every single week since it began. Um, thank you for your continued support. Um, thank you, David James. David James, James, the goalkeeper? Or yeah. Is it? No, I don't know. I think so. I'm, I'm going to say yes. I, I'm oh, going to say wow. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> England uh, international goalkeeper, David James. Yeah, yeah, he's the England goalkeeper, wasn't he? That used to yeah. play for Aston Villa. Yeah. No, how do you think I knew that? I don't know. I mean, to be fair, David James played for most clubs. Yeah, that's so, right. Like, I, mean, I just guess. I was, Liverpool. I was hoping you were. I was like, because you know, you know, I don't play football. Or I don't like football, and I was like, I was like hoping for a bit. How do you know that? Anyway, right. How anyway, did you know that? Just because. Um, he wrote it in his text message. Hey, I'm David James, former Aston Villa goalkeeper. Um, no, I don't know. David James, MBA. No, it's not him. This is David James. I'm sure he's a very good goalkeeper, this guy here, but it's not the David James. Anyway, um, thank you for tuning in every week. Um, pleasure having you and hope you're enjoying it. Um, so you recently viewed my YouTube video I done regarding the costs of bridging finance. Now, in that video, I discussed a particular deal I'm doing and a particular real-life example of the costs of bridging. Now, you were, uh, David said, I was surprised to find how costly this can be with all the hidden fees you mentioned. And I said, well, so was I. Now, your question is, is there a reason that I chose the bridging finance option as opposed to finding a joint venture partner or raising finance the way we teach at the event? Um, so my question is, is there a reason that you went down the, the bridging route as opposed to raising finance or joint venture uh, the way we teach at events um, and be more creative to raise the finance, uh, i.e. by speaking to private investors, networking, etc. And then I understand that speed may, may have been a consideration here, but just curious to know if you looked at more creative strategies that could have worked out cheaper. Okay. <clears throat> yes, I absolutely did. Um, however, for me, you're right, it was about speed and it was about not giving control away of the property. So the, 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 the amount of money I needed... Although we do, uh, teach, we do teach bridging finance on 
of, of the course. event. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. So we teach many ways to raise finance. One of them bridging, one of them joint venture, one of them like raising finance. So on this particular uh, deal, I do have a joint venture partner um, and they've, they've uh, contributed on a fixed term of 1.25% per month um, for a small loan um, for, to, to help towards the refurbishment. Now, uh, the actual purchase of the property, I invested my own money into that, um, a total of £118,000. And I also invested uh, the, the bridging finance, uh, they, they put 90, uh, the, the, the amount that came from them was £100,144.66. £100, so the cost of that, if I run it to the full term, is about £17,000. Okay, so it is quite costly. Um, but for me, it was about speed. This, first, it was about speed, getting it sorted fairly quickly. However, in hindsight, it took a lot longer. Secondly, was I didn't want to give any sort of ownership or control up against the property. Um, because what I find some, sometimes is that if you do a joint venture with somebody else, they want to take a percentage out of the uplift of the profit from the property. And I didn't, in this case, I, I wasn't happy giving that away. I wanted to, I wanted to well, well, if you think about it, though, although, although you could go, oh, it's really expensive, it's all relative. Yes. Because they've put in a similar amount of money to you. Yeah. They're making 17 grand. Yeah. How much are you going to make out of the deal? Uh, I, I should conservatively make profit. So I'll get all my money back plus I should yeah. make 80, 80, 90,000 pounds. So, so when you consider that they've put in as much money as you, so therefore, like, if you'd have had to have put in double, if you'd have had. Uh, You'd have to put in double that to, if you wanted, and it would have just made you an extra seventeen grand. But you then yeah. you'd have tried up and used yeah. a whole extra hundred and whatever the, it was. The thing is, six pence. Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. The thing is, the bridge is done over twelve months, and the interest is fully. You, you pay all the interest up front, um, but if you pay it back at the the minimum term is three months, so they charge a not point eight nine percent per month, which works out about seven hundred and seventy five pound a month. I'd mm. say three pence. No, I'm kidding. Um, so um, if I pay it back in three months, yes, I've got all my fixed costs, like the facility fee, the lender, insurance, all the admin fee, all that, that's fixed. I, I paid that. That's like four and a half thousand pounds. But the interest, you pay it monthly, subject to a minimum of three months. So if I pay it back in four months, that loan will have only cost me four months interest plus the fixed fees. And then the exit fee. So it won't be anywhere near the, the, the costs that I talked about in that video um, because I'm going to pay it back early. It's only, uh, the, the costs are only really expensive if you run it full term because the interest is, is quite expensive. And then if you go outside of the, the year term, the interest becomes 2%. It, 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 it over doubles. Um, so bridging. It's, very good, it's a very good question though, because to be honest, I suppose also is you know that there's bridges, it's like an easy option. Because bridging, you expect it. Whereas if you, otherwise, if you started again, it would be like, it is, it is an easier option. If I had people that came to me though and were like, hey, I've got 200 grand yeah. on your next development project, rather than getting bridging, would you want a JV with me? Yeah. I, I'd be, I would be very open to that. Well, ironically, I did get lots of messages after doing that video uh, of people yeah. saying, wow, I'd, be, I'd, I'd love that sort of, uh, even half that sort of interest on a, a JV loan with you. Um, so I've got like an inbox with about seven or eight people all, say, all offering to joint venture with me. Um, so look, there we are. That's what it is. Um, but yeah, great question. Maybe we'll do an episode on bridging finance um, in a couple of weeks. We'll do a, a detailed episode on bridging finance and actually the true cost because they, they, they say, um, like most bridges will tell you, like you can get like not point, uh, sorry, you can get 65% of the done up value, including development finance for a bridging finance. But the reality is that's gross. The reality is when it hits your bank, you only actually get about 50 to 53%. So it varies lender to lender. But after they take all the costs off, it's about yeah. 53, maybe 55%. Um, so you're still going to have to put 45% in. Yeah. Yeah. But, but uh, would you, would you, yeah. would you, in reality, would you be very open? I mean, not even doing it as a loan. I'd be very open rather than using bridge. I'd be very open to doing full on JVs where I gave people a percentage. If, if it was a good investor that I wanted yeah, to work with. Of course, of course. But it, the way I do it is I look at every investment singularly, like ind independently. This particular one, I, I was in a position where I had the money. So I didn't, it's not like I, 
I was, I, I've got like five, six deals going on at the minute. A couple of my deals have fallen through, so I, I, I'm not doing them anymore. Um, so I put my money in. Yeah, but 100%, I look at every deal on a deal by deal basis. And if there's an opportunity to do like, for instance, a big deal, then yeah, absolutely. I would definitely do joint venture, 100%. Because then share the wealth. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's not just about being greedy and keeping everything for yourself. I agree with sometimes keeping small de smaller deals for yourself, but certainly bigger deals, share the wealth, like spread the love. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, I agree. Cool. And on that bombshell, it's on now time to end on that bombshell. So guys, thanks ever so much for tuning in. Uh, remember, if you want to do a joint venture with us there, drop him a message on Instagram from the sounds of it. Uh, yeah. Now's the time to get in, get in with him. Um, thanks so much for tuning in and we will, uh, we'll see you next week. Uh, what was it like having Ricky without me? I'm assuming it was, uh, I saw the messages the, saying the, to get now, back now, to uh, Now we're at the end of the, 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 the show, I can tell you what somebody said, right? Because hopefully people, when we said now is the end, people would have switched off. No one will hear this. But. Well, one of the, uh, our academy students, Amelia, who, like, she's actually a really nice person, and I, like, I quite like her, right? She's a good friend, right? She said, annoyingly, that the show just wasn't the same without Russell. It wasn't funny. And I'm like, you what? It wasn't funny. Yeah, that's because I'm funny, mate. I'm, I'm, I'm hilarious. Wow. <laughs> I'd rather be known as the, the serious guy as opposed to the funny guy. So You're known as the, um, uh, so you're, you, the straight guy. No, I'm the straight guy. Who's the so? I'm, I'm the straight, straight guy. Person. What are you? I'm the straight. No. Guy. I'm the straight to the point guy. I'm the I'm the direct person that never has a laugh. That never. That that you're the one that they laugh at. Oh right, fine, yeah, yeah. That's right, yeah, yeah. Okay. Funny, I was laughing at you when you fell over a kid's scooter and broke your bloody elbow. Anyway. Of course you were. It's your chance. It's your chance. It's like ha ha. <laughs> you, you couldn't tie your own shoelaces. <laughs> so your wife had to tie your shoelaces for you. Anyway, on that note, guys, see you next week. Next week. Bye.